Good afternoon. Um, welcome to the live stream. Um, today is lecture 19. And we're going to be looking at an introduction to REST web services. There won't be too much coding this afternoon. Um, I'm going to try to give that overview. And um, I will show you some code. Um, but I want to show you some example of REST services online and ultimately the kind of thing I hope that you'll be building a little bit later. I see some messages in chat and um, Tig and Jordan are there. Hi guys, thanks for coming along and thanks to everybody else who's in the stream as well. Um, do ask questions if you wish as we're going along. I'm always happy to pause and we can um, we get through everything anyway. Okay. So let's move through this one. I'm trying to find a keyboard. Which keyboard am I I'm using? Uh, okay, so we're now into the final part of the module. Um, this is the this is part four. Um, understanding and using REST or RESTful APIs. Um, this is week ten. I guess so we're going to have this overview today. Um, 11, we're going to look at consuming RESTful APIs, I guess, that we've built. Now, we've covered a bit of that already in some of the bonus lessons that I would have given you. Um, this part here, I would have showed you how to consume those REST APIs with, um, with AJAX already. Um, and then, I guess, the last part is a bit more an, an overview of how to design and develop a RESTful API and some good practice. I have a feeling that um, I may be able to condense week 11 and week 12 so that I um, can fit in an actual overview of the examinations for you. Maybe next week um, in place of this, consuming REST APIs, and, uh, and uh, maybe, cons maybe combine week 11 and week 12 into a single lecture. The demo stuff will still be there, of course. I mean, I'll, I have the demos um, available for you. But the actual live stream, I may actually talk about the exam. Um, and uh, I see a message from Clinton there as well. Literally, I'm just talking about that. Um, uh, what will be on the exam? Yeah, so maybe I'll talk about that maybe next week um, in, in, in that space. And if that's the case, then I'll be, I'll be doing this um, in Teams. I won't be doing a live stream to talk about the exam. I'll, I'll do it in, in Teams, but I'll let you know well in advance of what's happening. So yeah, I think I'll probably maybe next week might be a good idea rather than the following week because that's the last week of lecture. So next week we talk about the exam. But I mean, I, all of the overview of the exam material and what I expect of you um, and how it will run is in the welcome page. Um, uh, that's on the uh, Moodle. Okay, so and uh, that's been there since the very beginning, um, since before the, the module actually started. And we'll, um, um, you know, there's a, a there's a multiple choice question section, which is worth twenty percent of the overall CS two thirty mark. And there's a coding exam, which is a twenty four hour coding exam. I give you a, a coding exercise at nine o'clock one morning, and you submit it before nine o'clock the next morning. It doesn't take twenty four hours. It should only take six or seven hours, maybe eight hours max, maybe. But um, you have you you can do it. Reason we send it over a day is that you can choose the time that suits you. Because I know some of you work as well, so we do it over the twenty four hour period. And then that's worth thirty percent, and then of course fifty percent comes from the um, from the CA which you're working on currently, and the coding exam will basically be very similar to the final couple of assignments, the kind of assignments that you're doing now. That's the kind of thing you'll have to do for the coding exam as well. So, and um, you'll have to build a RESTful API with a front end to it. And if you've been doing that, you'll walk through the exam no problem. The multiple choice is a there are two questions. Um, and um, I see I see that Clinton asked that question, so I'm just going to quickly reply. There are there are two questions. You have uh, an hour for the exam, half an hour per question, probably an average. And the two will be questions will be drawn from a bank, each from a bank of ten questions. And I will publish that bank of questions maybe next week, so that you have time to study and and um, and plan. So no surprises from me. All of the questions will be all of the multiple choice questions will be sorry. They're not multiple choice questions. We implement them in Moodle as a multiple choice. Uh, you, you get a random question um, um, in, in what a, a Moodle quiz, okay, which is, which is they're not multiple choices, they're, you, they're essay type answers. And um, so, yeah, I'll publish 10 questions in each bank next week, and you'll get a sense of what's expected from you. You can plan in advance, and then um, you do the exam on the day, and that's it. Um, I hope that gives you a quick overview, but we'll, um, we'll talk about more about it anyway, and I'll give you some examples. I'll show you the bank of questions then maybe next week during week 11 at this time um, in Teams rather than on live stream with YouTube, okay? Um, 
Charles, I see there's a, a message from you there about what date is the exam. I can't tell you that yet, unfortunately. Um, the, we have provisional exams, um, a uh, timetable that's been shared with some staff, but we have been asked not to share this with students because it's mostly um, available for us to check that we have proper, we don't have clashes internally. And, um, and uh, you know, we, we then, you know, they, once that's happening and we report to the exams office that everything looks okay for us, then it'll be checked it'll be checked online. So um, so I, I, I think mine are okay. And, um, and uh, then it will be shared with students, maybe provisional. So, okay, I see Jordan says that it's up now. Okay, well, that's good. Well, we've been asked, we have been told not to share yet. So it's grand. Um, so um, I don't know the, the exact time of mine until I'm given an official timetable and we haven't been given an official one yet. Okay, but we'll talk about exams next week. We need to get on with today's class, if that's okay. Um, if you do have questions, you can move me. Um, um, so something from Andre. Um, the grading for the assignments are underway um, and uh, they'll be done as soon as we can get through them, okay? Um, the, uh, the problem is that we've had to delay the submissions of all of the assignments for various reasons. So, so, so um, there's a couple of days extra delays, um, and uh, that's how it works. You know, if we have if we extend the submission time, then we clashes. We have to extend all of the um, the correction time as well. So, but we'll get them and get them back. And uh, the ga the goal for me is to make sure that all of the assignments are done and corrected within about a week after the end of the end of the um, semester so that gives you a chance to um, check and see if there's any issues with grades or something like that and then um, come back to us and we'll then have everything everything ready before the exam the, uh, you know you'll uh, you'll get your all the CA will be done in advance anyway before you get your and if there are issues of course we can always address them there's no problem with that I'm happy to look at those for anybody and we have been doing all along Okay, so we're going to look at the, the plan then. So today's lecture will be mostly focused on REST, and that's uh, an, acronym, uh, an acronym for representation, representational state transfer. And it's one approach to making REST services. We're going to work through, I guess, over this, these weeks, um, REST best practice and how to create a RESTful service using a Node.js app and um, using ExpressJS. Express JS. And of course, you can do these with PHP, Flask, any of the languages you prefer, Rust, Java, anything you like at all. Really, we're going to see a little bit how to um, use a RESTful API and uh, use that API using a curl type and um, things which we've seen early on. And we, um, we know how to do this as well already because we've looked at how to consume a RESTful API using um, AJAX already. So we're well, we're, we're, you know, we're well underway with this. So REST, as we said already, stands for um, representational state transfer. It's a standards-based architecture um, that uses the HTTP protocol and in essence, everything is centered on resources. And those resources are accessed using a common well-defined interface using HTTP standard methods or those verbs. And there, you know, get, post, put, um, delete, update, all that kind of stuff that we've seen already. So it was first introduced by Roy Fielding in 2000 in his PhD thesis that was entitled Architectural Styles and the Design of Network-Based architect Software Architectures. And um, you can have a look at that. Um, that article, um, that original thesis, if you want, from Fielding by just checking out the um, the, the link here, or you can just um, have a look at this REST API tutorial, which I use to help prepare my classes. So it's a very good re re reference. So, but with a, a REST architecture, a REST server, or a REST service, sometimes you hear these called or referred to as microservices, um, or an API, um, they provide access to resources, and then a REST client accesses and modifies the resources. And that's what you've been doing with your AJAX clients. And then um, if we just quickly um, have a look at the software that I've given you, we, um, you know, this software that we've used here is a very simple client software that uses um, a, it uses um, AJAX internally to be able to access a web service, which is written in this particular case is written and running in um, written in Node.js, and it sits here, and it becomes a service that's available via the web. So we can see that we um, are accessing it via the web up here. Okay, so that's um. So we've seen all, all of these things together, and I guess what we're trying to do here in this lecture is to give you some sense of how it all pulls together. 
Okay. So every resource, and these resources will either be a database table or entries in a table or collection of tables, or it will be um, documents that are in a collection-based database like MongoDB and your, your, your resources are JSON. Um, but they're uniquely uh, identified by URIs, okay? Um, and URIs are just global IDs. And REST uses various representations to represent resources like you can use text, you can use JSON, you can use XML. And JSON is very popular, and supposedly the most popular, but it's the one that we're going to focus on. We've been looking at JSON right through this month. So we're already familiar with the four HTTP protocol methods that are commonly used in REST-based architecture. And REST recommends that the resource methods um, are used to, these, to, to work with um, our resources. So a lot of people incorrectly relate the resource methods to HTTP get, put, post, and delete methods. We can use the methods to implement a uniform REST interface. So we tend to use in REST, and this is you know, how, we, how we work it. It doesn't have to work like this, but this is the way we, we, we do it. Um, get that used to provide read-only access to a resource. So you get something if you like, okay? Um, and post, that's used to create a new resource. We can essentially upload. Delete, we can use to remove a resource. And put is used to update an existing resource or to create a new resource. In principle, we could probably use post to do a few of them, you know, because we know that we can use post to send information, uh, send a request and get information back as well. But it's simpler and easier and handier to use get. And um, we could use post, of course, to update something as well, but it's best to use put, you know. And so we, we kind of have this nice arrangement that um, uh, translate across all the different kinds of APIs. So it's very, very good. So the, the implementing the REST interface doesn't really change much from how you've been using Node.js or if you want to use PHP in the last few weeks. We're just formalizing it in terms of how we structure uh, the access of the resource to our databases. In other words, that's what we're trying to get at. So I suppose um, REST and HTTP are not one and the same. So we tend to map this REST. REST is a model of how we get these things, and HTTP is how we would implement it or, or, or realize that model. So REST is the architectural style. And with this style, the data and functionality are considered resources and are accessed using a URL or URI. So, and the resources are acted upon by using a set of simple, well-defined operations. And the clients and servers exchange representations of resources by using the standard, standardized interface and, and protocol. And that's typically HTTP, but it doesn't have to be HTTP. So you know, we, we're doing it a particular way, but you could do it other ways as well. And the intention of REST then is to make the web or the internet more streamlined and standardized. And Fielding advocates using REST principles much more strictly, of course, and it's probably why people try to start comparing REST with web, HTTP. Fielding does not, in the thesis, you can look at it, mention any implementation directive, including any protocol reference to HTTP. So if, you're use, if you're not using REST, uh, you're not using REST if you're using HTTP, you need to fill the six guiding principle of REST, and then you can call your interface RESTful. In other words, you can use HTTP set up this API, this interface, but it would not be REST or RESTful. Okay? So we need to use the guiding guidances. And here are the six principles. It needs to be a client-server architecture. So by separating the user interface and concerns from the data storage concerns, we improve the portability of the user interface across multiple platforms, and we improve the scalability by simplifying the server components. And if we quickly go back to my example that I've been using in the bonus dem uh, lessons here, you know that this front end has not changed at all. You know, it, this, we wrote this in the very first lesson up to lesson eight. First of all, we had a, an API that just um, <clears throat> gave us a bunch of information that was stored internally in data in, in the app. Then we moved to a relational database. Then we moved to a MongoDB database. We also then just wrote straight up HTTP and within Node.js. We wrote an, an, uh, an Express-based app. And I recently showed you how to use PHP with MongoDB. And I could very easily just implement the back end to this using this. As well. So we're separating the client and the service, and what happens is the protocol of exchange between the two remains consistent. And so that's a proper true client server application. 
it's stateless, okay? I mean, a real important is that the, the whole setup is that each request from the client to the server must contain all of the information necessary to understand that single request. We can, and it cannot take advantage of any stored context of the request on the server. Session state is kept entirely on the client. No reason whatsoever to have anything. Server doesn't care who's making the request. It doesn't matter whether I'm making the call from this computer or, or from my other computer here. It doesn't matter as long as it's accessible. Cacheable. We really should have a cache. And the cache constraints require that the data win and response to requests be implicitly or explicitly labeled as cacheable or non-cacheable. And if a response is cacheable, then a client cache is given the, light, the, the right to reuse that response for later, or for later equivalent requests. And that's really useful because, I mean, <clears throat> if you can set up your API to ensure that the response is cached by the service, then the next request that comes in can be served a lot quicker and a lot faster. And that's really useful. Um, um, so that's, that's the first three. I see a question there. So if I want to insert data into a MongoDB database, do you just use the post function like this? Yes. Um, you use the post function to get the data from the client to the API. And you can use that depending on what the database in the back end is. So you could essentially take data from a client, okay? So we could go to this client here, and you can see we could have these data here. And once we have these data, we capture these data. And then when we send the data, we're sending those data using a post request to some service. That post, that service then knows it's going to capture the information as part of a post request in its body, okay? Um, and when we have that data, um, we're able to do something with that data. So the data then, so we have a specific API data that, that um, we load into our, say, our Node.js program, and it talks to MongoDB server, for example. And that will use a form of interface as well. We, we don't explicitly have the details, but if you search, you can find out you know, how the data is exchanged between your backend service and MongoDB or to the relational database. It's perfectly easy and straightforward to write, to have a, this front end, talking to the back end, sending the data in post, and your back end server can write to both a relational database and a MongoDB database, or 10 other databases, databases all one after the other simultaneously, using the same information that was supplied by that single post request to the service or to that API, okay? Okay, okay, Terminal, I see, yeah, okay, I hope you get it, that's, that's not so bad, okay? So, one of the things that we could do, for example, I mean, and sometimes I, I, and here's a, I suppose a, a quick tip, um, I often um, ask an exam question, which doesn't use any, any of these things, but it's just to, to show you that, often asking an exam question to say, how would you write a program in PHP or in Node.js, for example, to copy all of the data from a, a MongoDB database and insert it into a relational database? or vice versa. So I could ask the question in an exam that says, write a server-side program that, cut, and I know this is nothing to do with REST, but it follows on a little bit from the question that you asked, you know, and about insertions and so forth. So we could write a simple, I could say, write a Node.js program that copies data from a relational database into uh, a MongoDB database. Or copy, uh, write a piece of software that copies all the data from a PHP application that copies all the data from one MySQL database into another MySQL. So all of the bonus code that I've given you should show you how to do all of that. So if you've got an exam question, you should be able to answer it using all the material that I've provided already for you in the bonus stuff. And the reason I provided that bonus stuff is because I know I asked those questions on the exam ultimately as well, as apart from it being useful here, okay? So there's a lot going on with those programs um, if you look at them and understand them. So you might be a bit dismissive and say, okay, I'm only going to focus on writing Node.js and MongoDB software. And then when it comes to the coding exam, that's what I'm going to use. And that's... But at some point in the theoretical perspective, I've covered a lot of material around using the different languages and different setups. I may ask you something around that. So, you know, yeah, choose your, your desired platform in order to be able to answer your assignments. But the exam, you may need to know a little bit more than that. But that's just uh, an aside. Yeah, let's go back to this, okay? So those are the first three. Um, 
Okay, so we want to have this uniform interface, and this is really important, this uniform interface. So applying software engineering, and you lot, most of you, all of you are software engineers, and by applying the software engineering principle of generality to the component interface, the overall system architecture is simplified, and, and the visibility of the interactions is improved. So in order to obtain this uniform interface, multiple architectural constraints are needed to guide the behavior of the components. And REST is defined by four interface constraints. Identification of the resources, the manipulation of the resources through representations, self-descriptive messages, and hypermedia as the engine of application state. You know, and that's something to bear in mind. We, we, we know, and if you, if you look at the kind of programs that we've been using in the bonus lessons, for example, and in my other core lessons, you'll see that they all maintain this uniformity. We have this layered system. So the system allows an architecture to be composed of, composed of hierarchical layers by constraining the component behavior, such as each component cannot see beyond the immediate layer of which they're interacting with. It's a useful thing to do. And then we have code on demand, and that's an optional thing. Okay, so the rest allows the client functionality to be expended by downloading and executing code in the form of applets and scripts. And it simplifies clients by reducing the number of features required to be pre-implemented. So you can actually have an API that tells you, so you make a request to get some data, and it will, you can actually download the code that helps you download or use the API a little bit later. That's really useful. So, and we have also have this notion of REST architectural decoupling. Okay, and again, as I said before, you know, if you have a look at this online resource, um, which I'm just hiding, I guess, there, um, uh, this one, this REST API tutorial, and that's a really good one, okay? And um, you could have a look at it. So with REST, resources are decoupled from the representation so that the content can be accessed in a variety of formats, HTML, XML, text, PDF, JPEG, JSON, etc. So you could have a collection-based collection like a relational database. And you could, that's the way you store your resources and your data. You could have a REST API to that that actually gives back the information in JSON or text, you know, or XML, you know, whatever you want. If you have something that deals with images, then you have a repository that has images or generates charts, for example, you could return the charts as XML, you could turn, return the charts as PDFs, JPEGs, SVGs, all of that kind of stuff. So this decoupling from the representation, so the, the, the representation that you send can be different from the representation in terms of storage. You don't have to share how, it's, how the architecture is stored, you just let people know how you want to get these things back again. So metadata, and it's data about data, in terms of the resources available should be used, for example, to control caching, detect the transmission errors, negotiate appropriate representation formats, and perform all sorts of authentication and access. And most importantly, every interaction with the resource is stateless. That is key, okay? Stateless is one of the six architectural constraints that we saw earlier, and um, that's really, really important. And as we examine each of these in detail in the following slides, I'm gonna use the guidelines in the tutorial links below. It's succinct gives you all you need theoretically for this module. So please, please, please have a look at this. Okay. Six constraints are uniform interface, client server, stateless, cacheable, layered system, code on demand. Saw those already. Okay. And let's have a look at the time. Yeah, so this uniform interface, let me go back up here. Um, you have to decide in the API to interface. You, you must decide for the resources inside the system that are exposed to the API consumers and then follow this religiously, okay? A resource in the system should always have only one logical URI and that should provide a way to, <clears throat> to fetch related or additional data. It's always best to associate a resource with a web page. Okay? A, a resource should be too large to contain each and everything in its representation. Whenever relevant, a resource should contain links pointing to relative URIs to fetch related information, okay? And this, is, um, this approach is called us hypermedia as the engine of application state. And it's a real component of REST. And um, really what's important is that you should look at um, proper naming conventions, proper link formats or data formats, and all resources should be accessible through a common approach, such as HTTP GET or whatever is modified, whatever you decide be consistent. In terms of client server and statelessness, and um, that means the client application or server must be able to evolve separately without any dependency on each other. And again, really, when we looked at this application here, the front end, which was a separate index.html, was provided by the client, provided by the API to tell you how to access the information, how to set up the information. This was 
given to me by the API. And I was able to work with this. But I could develop this independently of the API. Yeah, and I could change the API and never had to change. It's really, really important. The feeling was inspired by HTTP, so it's reflected in its whole stateless constraint. Make all your client server interactions stateless. It doesn't store anything about the latest HTTP request. No session, no history. You may have to have an authentication key as well, which you supply as part of every request. I don't do security in this module, but certainly worth looking. Um, if the client needs to be a stateful application for the end user, where you log in once and perform other authorized operations, every request from the client does have to contain all the information necessary to service that request. We need to do this a lot if we're looking at um, resources behind the paywall, and I'll show you one later. So caching, layered, all that kind of stuff, code and demand, um, you can have a look at this. Okay, The code and demand is nice. I really like this. Um, most of the time, you're going to be sending the static representation of the resources back in the form of, of, of XML or JSON. But when necessary, you're free to return executable code to support part of the application. In other words, clients can call your API to get a UI widget rendering code. This is permissible. I really like this feature. And that's what was going on here. Why I wrote it this way, because it was a recommendation of REST. So how do we design a RESTful API? There's a beautiful approach to doing this on Hacker Moon. Okay, I don't know if you know this website, but there's a great, great article here um, on um, uh, called RESTful API Designing Guidelines, the Best Practices on Hacker Moon. And it's worth reading this, you know, it tells you how best to design your API, okay? So a couple of things you need to know. When you're dealing with these resource resource is the option or the representation that something has which is some associated data with it so it can be set of methods to operate on it so employees then delete and add and update are the operations that are performed on those oper on, on those resources collections are the sets of resources like companies is the collection of company resources <coughs> employee <coughs> employees is the collection of employee resources url is a path through which a resource can be located and some actions can be performed on it so this beautiful article here really gives an example of some API endpoints. And those like, you know, when we implement those get requests or something, those URIs or those routes that we have, we refer to those as endpoints, API endpoints. So here are some examples for companies and has some for employees. Get all employees, for example, is an endpoint or just an API okay, request that will respond with the list of employees. We could have add new employee, update employee, delete employee, delete all employees, promote employee, promote all employees. So it's really a sensible way of, recommend, of, of, of generating a route. Okay? So if we were to go back to our, our software, um, you know, we could see that we had some, this is, which one is this? Let's look at the MySQL one. Um, so we could see that we had roots here, and our root here was just this one, which is just the root that returns the code in order to work with it. But here we had get the API slash user. So this is our endpoint, our user endpoint here. Okay? That just, in other words, just tells me this user. In fact, really a better way to do and design. So this is poorly designed according to the information um, here, because really it's not, the, the endpoints aren't reflected. Really what it should be here is, um, we should really call this, API slash users, these it returns all users, or get all users. Here we had the same root or the same API root here that we were using for the post request, which is API slash user um, here. And again, it's badly designed. I mean, it works, but from a, a design of an API, um, a REST API, it's bad, you know? So what's happening here is it should be add user, okay? If you want it and it's post. So, you know, we, we were just making the distinction between this endpoint and this endpoint, which are the same endpoint, by virtue of the fact that we were using get here and post here. So while this is a workable, perfectly fine API, in terms of design, it's not particular. So, you know, I would need to change this if I wanted to do and make a good job. So there are lots of other endpoints for different operations, all contain many of the redundant actions. So we have to think about when we design this RESTful API, we've got to think about the nouns and verbs. 
So you, your URL should only contain resources and nouns, not actions or verbs. So this API, add new employee along with the resource name employee, the endpoint employees alone would be prefer preferable. Okay, so, so we could actually preference it with a noun if we want. So it's best to have company and companies here. So really, when we go back to this one here, so we say, mm, user, that's not good. But should we be having add or something? No, what we're saying is, but we really should change this to be users. Okay, and that would be useful. Okay. So how do we deal with the verbs or the actions that are required where we want to do that? That's why we have the get, a post, and delete, and put. So those verbs play the important role. Um, so if we use get and the path companies, we would get a list of all companies. Get and companies 34, that would give the details of company with ID 34. Delete and path would delete this company. The method get and path company slash three slash employee slash 45 would get the details of employee with ID 45, which belongs to company with ID 3. Okay. So the, the, the um, verbs here are, are the verbs. <laughs> Okay, so the actions or the verbs are represented by the HTTP verbs, and that's a good design. We also have some really good recommendations from Microsoft on the RESTful API endpoints. And again, we could have a look at this article down here at the corner on Web API Design from Microsoft, very similar to the Hacker Moon one that I talked about earlier. You know, here's an example where you have the link to the, the, um, the URI. And then we have orders and one, and that's the rest part and the response body will return this JSON. So this is the unique order. So a unique URI explicitly gets to this. So essentially, clients interact with a service by exchanging representation of resources. And many web APIs use JSON as the exchange. You can use a get request of the URI to return the body alongside. And of course, we can build um, uh, as part of the post request, we can submit the JSON as well. Useful too. So the REST APIs are driven by hypermedia links and then URLs, in other words, that are contained in the representations. This shows you a JSON representation of an order, for example. It contains the links to get the update of a customer associated with an order. And so, you know, it's not dissimilar to the kind of thing that you're working on in your, in your current um, assignments. The REST APIs are driven by these links and they're, they're you know, and, and uh, so you can see here we have some links and we're able to get a relative link to be able to find um, information about, about uh, So really, I think it's best to adopt this consistent naming convention for your URIs. Um, it helps to use plural nouns for URIs that reference collections, and it's good practice to organize URIs for collections and items into a hierarchy. So slash customers is the path to the customer collection, and customer slash five is the path to a customer with ID equal to five. And it helps keep the web API intuitive. Many web API frameworks can request based on a parameterized path. You can actually define a route using um, slash customers. Instead of the slash, you actually just put a, a, an ID in here as well. And that would be a nice way to do it in, in chain brackets. So you should also consider um, the relationships between different types of resources and how you might expose these associations. And so, for example, the customer slash five slash orders, that could represent all the orders for customer number five. You could also go in the other direction and say, represent the association from an order back to a customer and say slash orders 99 slash customer, and that would like, you know, be able to get the other direction. But that could be really cumbersome to implement. So a better solution would be to provide these navigable into links in the, to associated resources in the body of the response. And that article that I, sh that I referenced down here in terms of designing um, the, on the earlier page shows you the best way to do that. And we can use Hetos again, as we saw earlier, to enable the navigation of the resources. In complex systems, it's very tempting to provide URIs that enable a client to navigate through real, all these different levels of relationships, such as customers slash one slash order slash 99 slash products. That's really complex, guys. So um, difficult to maintain, it's inflexible and, and, and what happens if the relationship between the resources change in the future? You know, you got to watch that. So also have to consider the relationship between the different types of resources and you might expose these. So if we have, say, slash customer, slash five, slash orders, that represent all the orders for customer five. You could go in the other direction. Oh, so we saw that, you know, and, and it represents the associates from our back to a customer. Yeah, it's very, very difficult. So you want to watch that kind of stuff.
So let's revisit the HTTP verbs. So get. So we want to use get to retrieve a representation of a resource at a specified URL or URI, and the body of the response message contains the details of the requested resource. Post then creates a new resource. Post can be used to trigger operations that don't actually create resources as well. If you wanted, you could be doing it to do the get type stuff. Put creates or replaces resources. You know, you want to um, update or replace a resource that doesn't exist. So if it doesn't exist already, you're actually using put implement a post type request. Patch is a nice one, performs a partial update to a resource, and the body specifies the changes to apply, and delete, of course, removes the resource. We've decided this is the best way to do it. Um, a server, I'm centering, you know, I'll repeat the first two here, but you know, a server might support updates, but not the creation via put. Well, so you gotta watch that kind of stuff. Whether to support this depends on whether the client can meaningfully assign a URI to a resource before it exists. If not, then use the post, and then use a put or a patch to update. And a patch again, as we said, is this partial update. And a lot of people don't tend not to use this, but you can set this up and make it work. It can be much more efficient than using put. The client only sends the changes and not the entire representation of the resource. Technically, patch can create new resources as well, okay? And, and you can do that if the server supports that. Um, so put requests needs to be independent. Okay, so if a client submits the same put request multiple times, the results should always be the same. So if it's the same resource, we modify by the same values. Post and patch requests are not guaranteed to be independent. Okay, so that's something that's really important to realize. Is somebody hits a, you know, a reload, essentially sending a request again. Okay. So here we can look at how you can match these into endpoint tables. So you could have the resource slash customers, like I had earlier with slash user, which slash API slash user, it should be maybe slash API slash users. A lot of time you see this, instead of the slash here in front of the customers, you'll see slash API slash V1 or slash V2 to show the version or the live version. But it's this last part here to the resource. <clears throat> so we can say then what a post, a get, a put, and a delete does on this resource. And then customer slash one, well, post error, this will give an error, and this will, these will work. And customer slash one slash orders creates a new order, retrieves bulk or remove dependent. So really when you're designing your API, you ultimately need to get to the point here where you have this table. And then you design the table. And so when I worked and was building this, for example, this code here, I was looking essentially at following the guidelines from here. I use slash API slash user. I didn't make it slash users because I knew eventually I'd be getting to this lecture. I could show you what a bad design it was. But yeah, I could go back and make it. I know it doesn't make any difference or sense in terms of the working part of the program, but it does make a difference in terms of understanding and making a meaningful API endpoint table. Okay, so we're near the end. Let's have a look at a couple of examples. So we saw um, some of these things working already. Let me just go to the code. So we see that these are the, are the, the code that I've written for you. Something I, I'd recommend earlier, by the way, is that um, I'll, I'll probably share this with you as well. Um, this is a nice way um, of using environment processes to hide the username and host and passwords. I have these stored locally in a file called .env, and then I'm using this um, .env and um, here, a uh, module within Node.js um, to load in the information about the host, the user, the pass, the database, all that kind of stuff, so that I can use it in my examples. This is the MongoDB example here. Um, I don't know which one is running currently. Oh, so we can see easily by just running the program. Have a look at this one. So this REST API, um, I'll just uh, let's reload this one here. I'm reloading the page. I'm going to retrieve my database and I know from the, the information the fact that I'm not getting a, an object ID back that this is the relational database code is running so let's see this and verify this yeah um so yeah I'm running here so that yeah that was the uh that was this though the um here um this Uh, that's the one that was running there. So now let's run the MongoDB one. MongoDB one is here. 
Everything else is the same, apart from the fact I'm talking to MongoDB database, and now I'll reload this, get the user database, and I'm pulling the information from the MongoDB database, and you can see it is because there, every record that was created has this information here in the record. Um, something interesting about this, I'll talk to you about it again. No, it doesn't, doesn't matter. But look, you people published all these um, these APIs that make them available for you to play with. So I, I have a few that I use and they're, they're great fun. So you can find um, publicly available APIs by just doing some kind of search. But some on GitHub here, and these are public APIs. They're a collection of APIs that you can use. And the reason I, I recommend people look at them is because, and use them, is because they um, it shows you how to design them. So there's lots of these here, these available one here. I see one about Catfax, which is really nice. Um, uh, let's look at the games and comics ones here. Um, so I would be very interested in this particular one because there's a lot of games. The Riot Games ones here, um, that allows you to be able to look at, I don't know if you play Riot or do any Riot games, but um, um, they, this particular one is really nice because you, know, you can actually go through and have a look. And I use the uh, Legends of Terra one um, and it allows us to be able to do all sorts of fun stuff. Here's the APIs up here. So you can write them code and you can actually run these codes um, and you can see, okay, so here's your information. Here's a get version one counts. And you can pull down the information. Uh, so League of Legends, whole bunch of stuff, you know, you can get information about, about what's happening, not just about the league, okay, or the, here, but you can actually get all sorts of information with the individual cards, for example, in, in um, League of Legends. Uh, sorry, in Legends of Terror. Um, for example, um, here's the Magic database for Magic the Gathering. I mean, there's Strixhaven, there's a new one that's been released now. And I mean, if you, don't, if you want to look at all the cards, and you can't be bothered opening up the app and playing it on your phone or something, or wherever. I, I use iOS for this as well. So, um, you know, you can pull down all that information and access all of the cards. So if you want to look at Strickhaven, you could very easily um, find and use this API to pull down all the information, get the images of the cards, get rules, you can check. You can do all, and you can see the API here, get cards, cards ID, sets, all this kind of stuff here. And then there's actually an, an actual SDK that you can use to write your own software um, that will manipulate all of this, all of the, the information that you need to know about um, your cards. Um, that's the Magic the Gathering one, as I said. Um, there's the Open Weather, which allows you to be able to pull in all the information. Again, it's a you can see code here for how you can run a query to get the weather here, there, and everywhere. You can install this, the, this SDK. Um, for this particular one here, though, you actually have to sign up and get a key. So then you could do this. Um, here's a great big list of free and open APIs. Um, this is a lovely one, okay, because this allows you to be able to generate image charts. So it'll generate an image. You can get charts of all of these things, and you can send an API. You send it to data, and it will generate this image. So here's a, a data, and you can just send it um, a, a request as part of the URL. And we can just press this here, and it will generate this chart for you. Brilliant. Yeah, it's okay, and it's fine. And you can see that, you know, we can actually change the world there. We can change this URL to be... And it changes these things around so you can manipulate and change and get all that sort of stuff. This is a free API for you as well. Um here. Okay, food facts, yeah, you can get information about products. Again, it's a it's an open food fact and you can get the API. It's it's available free. Cat facts, oh that's good. Um, so we can find information about cats. Um and uh yeah, and we can get um more information. So yeah, you can just here's a here's the API that's used in the cat facts facts website. You know, you can get the facts and you can get some random ones, and you can see it's very simple. So here's the get request, and you can look for cats or whatever, and you can see that it's obviously using a MongoDB database in the back end because you see this is here, and we get this information that's back, and we can get the facts having a specific fact, um, and we can get facts that have been generated by me and you know, facts about horses or cats, all this kind of stuff. So, you know, all of these APIs are using the good practice that we would we would see um, recommended in those earlier articles. So, you know, you can play with these if you don't want to write your own. Of course, you learn best by writing your own. But um, I use uh, I use these for fun sometimes. Um, 
so i think that might just be it um so we've covered all that stuff i mean i can just have quickly show you the code again if you want um i think it's all working yeah these are all just fine and um, they're all working just fine. um and we can do this okay yeah so it's not too bad um we can uh Try all that stuff. If you might want to go back now and have a look at some of all those example codes that I've um, that I've given you, and you can maybe make some changes. I guess the the point to make is that the, the most one of the most important slides, I guess, in this particular lesson is this one here. Okay, you really when you design your HTTP um, verb and endpoint table or API endpoint table, you need to map the resources and then your posts get put and delete. And you may have patch as well, of course, in here. Um, and then you can decide what happens for each of these and then you implement how it works and you can see like i use i use slash api slash users or slash user really i mean you'll see for example in the magic and in terra and some of the others they use slash api slash v1 and you know you might have different versions that you use as well and um, so we can uh we can see how this works um and uh, it will be nice for you to be able to have a look at that in a little bit more detail Okay, so I see a couple of questions coming in before we finish then. Some five requirements, seven and eight mentioned validation. I was wondering if you provide any pointers surrounding about validation practices. Um, okay, yeah, maybe I can just, if you, if you just send me a message on Teams, I can get back to you and send you a little bit about that. And um, really what I'm talking about is with validation. So if you, if you look at, um, okay, so there's two ways to, to think about validation. Normally, when we have the post requests coming in, you can check as part of the post requests, you can do that. But let me just do a quick search here and I'll show you the kind of thing you need to look for. Okay, so um, uh, just how to put info value. So you can have this um, validator, which you can use for Express as well, okay? Um, and you can use you can use this validator with Node.js, and there's some nice examples around this. Okay, and um, so what I tend to do my validation, you could do the validation on the front end, of course, with the form, or you can do the validation before you send the data. Okay, and you can very easily do that as part of you know you because we're trapping in the form that we used earlier, um, or in the form that we used earlier here. Here, I didn't do any validation at all. But when we click here, you'll notice that as part of that request, we replaced the submit button with our own JavaScript function. And in that JavaScript function is where you perform the validation. And there are some nice JavaScript libraries that you can use that will help you with, with checking the validation against your expectations there. So um, you could do that. So then the data is validated, if you like, before it gets sent across to the API. But of course, something may happen to that data en route. I mean, you expect it won't change but then you will need to do the validation on the back end as well. And if you're using Express as your processor, then you can do the validations or you can manually, you can manually do, do this of course as well. So there's some nice examples here on how to do the validation here. And really um, you want to look at Express validation if you're using Express. Um, otherwise you're gonna to have to do an awful lot of manual work yourself. Um, I'd recommend this one. Um, it's a good idea to do it on the API side, mostly I think. Um, and again, have appropriate return and error handling because what happens here is that it's possible to use Postman or, or, or anywhere else to send the information. We might be talking, and as I've showed you examples before, that um, I showed you how to, how to run this software and access it using Postman or Insomnia. And when you do that, then you, know, um, you can't be sure that the data didn't come by your nice form that you built and was validated before it was sent as part of the get or the post request. So um, you have to handle all that in the API. And that's how you would tend typically do this. But early on, I specifically say to you not to worry about it, like as you say, um, that you would have um, validation a little bit later, but it's much harder to do with um, manually, essentially in Node.js. For your examples, you don't have too many items to validate. But ideally, you would need to do it, and the best way to do it is using express validation. I hope that answers it. I mean, but you can, if you need further details, let me know, please. Have you any further questions? No? 
Okay, we leave it there. And um, okay, so and as I said, next week's live lecture, um, uh, I'll probably give in Teams because I'll talk about the exams. Okay, and then, um, but the, the the lessons will be available. Just before we leave, people can edit the page. Okay, of course you can. You can watch this fun things tag. Yeah, yeah. And so I always like to um, I always like to do my validation on my API side. That's where the work happens. Okay. Um, uh, and uh, no problem, Jordan. I mean, it's it's crazy at the moment that you guys are under huge pressure, and I mean we're under pressure as well, of course. But um, we'll try to find something work. I did ask um so that you could get extensions from other colleagues as well, and um, hopefully it'll work out a little bit for you. But if you don't, talk to me. As I said before, you know, um, and I say it again, you can always contact me directly to you know personal things, you know, and if you need to, if you need to. Um, extend or get extensions i'm usually accommodating we do our best to help you and um, you know i probably won't do it all the time every time because you know I'm, i would have concerns that i don't want assignments running in and catching up and then running into the next one running into the next one then you're in a constant state of playing catch up and that can be stressful as well and i don't really want that and um, so i'm also um i'm also looking at, at uh, yeah reducing this a little bit um, I will publish the questions, the exam questions, as I said, and we'll talk about, uh, we can talk about anything related to the exams next week. So bring your questions. And thanks again for coming. I appreciate it. I, I do appreciate the feedback and the interaction. And um, best of luck with the current assignment. Okay. Thank you very much. See you next week.